This is Mr. Mitchell, and this is the first screencast of the first lesson of the first unit of American History 1. Uh, a couple things that I need to, to say right off is that if you use these screencasts, they will be very helpful in helping you understand the lectures beyond just what the text and the visuals of the PowerPoint show you. Also, what you should keep in mind is that the key terms list that comes with each unit correlates exactly with these lectures, and the study guides correlate exactly with these lectures. That being said, any quizzes or tests that you take will also be directly in correlation with these lectures. Everything is built to be streamlined. Uh, so with that being said, let me get started. And uh, if you listen to what I say, it goes beyond what the, uh, the text of the PowerPoint says, and it can help you uh, further and more deeply understand the material. So the very first lecture of the very first uh, unit of American History 1 is going to be about the discovery of the United States, uh, and it is a product of European exploration. Sometimes you'll need to watch the mouse because I might point to certain things on the map. You should at this point have a printed out copy of the lecture notes. You will be filling those in as I go along. If I go too fast, uh, you may want to pause the recording, and that is fine. If you have any questions that you don't feel get answered because of the way I'm describing things, feel free to email me at any time. So every one of my lectures is going to begin with an essential idea. Think of an essential idea as a topic sentence to a paragraph or a thesis statement for an essay. So it's basically laying out the main idea of each lecture. So if you look at this one, and you should be writing this at the very top of the first page of your lecture notes, uh, it's going to talk about this concept of an old world and a new world. So in American history, whenever we refer to the old world, we are referring basically to the countries of the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. When we talk about the new worlds, we're talking about uh, the Americas. And of course, the, to use the word old is a, uh, a term that is kind of Eurocentric because it's assuming that Europe and Africa and Asia were older than the Americas. Uh, but as you'll see as we go through the course of this lecture, the so-called New World or the Americas had been around for quite a while. One really interesting way to look at this lecture is to think of basically the globe as having two different worlds uh, being shared on one planet and they develop independently for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years according to theories, and then all of a sudden they come into contact with one another. And one way to think of this to make it more interesting is to think of what would happen if aliens arrived and all of a sudden the, an alien world came into contact with Earth. It's kind of like that when you have the connection of the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. Again, two different worlds that basically came into contact after tens of thousands of years of developing independently. So moving forward, uh, we will talk first where about the New World, which will be the Americas, North and South America. And if you look down, if you follow the mouse, you can see that there is an animated picture here, and it is showing you ocean levels over time. Now, uh, what is going to end up happening is during, according to most theories, during the last ice age, the map that you see right now is what things look like. The water was in the polar, it was locked up in the ice caps, and when that happens, the water levels go down and it exposes land that otherwise would be covered with water. Like today, the map looks more like it is right now in the modern look with there being water between modern-day Russia and modern-day Alaska. Uh, first humans were theorized to have originated in the so-called Old World, and then the question is how did they end up in the Americas? How did Native Americans end up in the United States, present-day United States and North America and South America? Uh, the major idea is that they migrated over the land bridge you see in the visual now, and that they basically arrived probably following animal herds. And then once they arrived, they didn't just stay in what is basically the right-hand side of the map. They didn't just stay in Alaska. They actually, over time, spread all across 
uh, the Americas, North and South America. Uh, one particular part that I'm going to talk about first, though, is going to be an area of the so-called New World, the uh, Americas, that had a very good climate, and that area is known as Mesoamerica. So if you're looking in your notes now, you should be writing under the word location uh, the description of Mesoamerica. This is basically present-day Mexico, uh, Central America, and a little bit of Northern South America. If you look over here at the, at the inset uh, map there, you can see where I'm talking about. This area of the New World, or the Americas, is known for having a very, very steady climate. And the thing that is, is uh, very crucial about this is that if you have a climate that is warm and stable, then you don't have to, if you're a Native American, you don't have to chase herds around as a food source. If you have a stable climate, you can stay in one place, you can grow crops, you can store crops, and in the end, you have what's known as, uh, I believe in world history, they call this the Neolithic Revolution. In American history, we're going to call this the Agricultural Revolution, which I believe is on your key terms list. So it's always a good idea to have your key terms list out whenever you're going through these review notes. So what ends up happening is that in the, the early history of uh, the Americas, of human involvement in the Americas, uh, you will have Native Americans learn how to grow crops and basically domesticate crops. There was not much domestication of animals. Most domestication of animals happened in the old world, not so much in the new world. Uh, but they were able to learn to grow crops because there was a good climate. There was a stable climate. Uh, you did not have to chase food sources around anymore. There's no more chasing, for example, the woolly mammoth around. You grow food. You can stay in one place. And that's going to have a major impact because if you can stay in one place, you don't have to have a mobile society. You can start building some permanent buildings. So what ends up happening in Mesoamerica as a result of this agricultural revolution is you end up having a very centralized culture where people basically live near the food sources that they are growing. Now, there were multiple agricultural revolutions across the world. The one that you need to know about for the sake of this class is the one that happens in Mesoamerica. And this was largely centered around the growth of corn or maize, basically same difference. And when people are able to build these, or, or excuse me, not build these, uh, grow these crops, they are able to stay in one place. And when they can stay in one place, they don't have to follow herds around. They start to have time to do other things besides hunting food all the time. And some of the things that people do is they start to build buildings. For example, here you see some of the famous uh, Aztec temples. The Aztecs were known for building big cities. So one of the big benefits of the agricultural revolution and one of the big benefits of growing corn slash maize is that civilizations are going to, be, going to be able to form. These are civilizations that have complex societies, like the notes say. They are able to grow in population because they have a stable food source. People are going to live longer. You're going to have less issue of people struggling to find food sources. Uh, you're going to see the development of mathematics among some of these groups. You're going to see the development of calendar making. You're going to see advances in science and, and architecture. And it's not real popularly known, but a lot of these cities were as big, if not bigger, than some European cities at the same time. There is a big downside, however, to people being all located in one centralized location. Even though they live in a place where they can help each other out, uh, even when they live in a place where they can learn from each other and build these big cities. One of the big downfalls is that if they're all in one place and an enemy comes along or a disease co comes along, they're much easier to be uh, to wipe out. So what you're going to end up seeing is that whenever the Europeans discover, quote, discover uh, the new world, they will find uh, basically all these people in Mesoamerica all in one place, and because they're all in one place, they're easy to wipe out. Whenever European diseases that these Native Americans weren't immune to start to spread, they spread very quickly, 
And one of the reasons the Europeans have such an easy time wiping out the Native Americans is because they were helped by, inadvertently, by biological warfare. Diseases famously like smallpox are going to help wipe out a lot of these populations. And even those that live, they're still living, even if they live uh, beyond the disease, they still are in one centralized location and therefore are easy to round up and, and be uh, conquered, sometimes killed, sometimes enslaved by Europeans coming from the so-called old world. I'll talk about them later. Real quickly, I'll talk a, a briefly about some of the cultures that grew in Mesoamerica. Uh, you have the Mayans. The Mayans were known for their architecture. They're known for their mathematics, uh, their developments in math. These were not primitive cultures. That's something to know is that these were not people that were dumb. These were not people that were savage and uncivilized. Overall, they were very intelligent and very advanced in ways that Europeans and maybe Americans today don't recognize as advanced, but they were advanced. Uh, most infamously, the Mayans were known for their calendar making, and then in 2012, some of you may remember that there was fear that the end of the world was coming in December of 2012 because the Mayan calendar seemed to end at that point. Well, here we are, uh, still alive and well, so why their calendar ended in 2012, I'm not sure but it did not signal the end of the world. The most famous, and if you are one of their victims, the most infamous of the groups of Mesoamerica will be the Aztecs. Now the Aztecs were known for building very sophisticated cities. They built pyramids, just like the Egyptians were known for building pyramids. They had enormous cities, uh, some of them again bigger than European cities, at the same time, uh, but they were not exactly known for being well uh, or for treating their neighbors very well. If you look at the picture here at the bottom right, you can see a famous image of uh, a sacrifice. What would happen is the Aztecs would often enslave their weaker neighbors and oftentimes subject the weaker neighbors to sacrifices to appease the gods. And what would basically happen is you see where the mouse is here, they would rip or cut out the heart of a victim and then throw the victims down the stairs of these pyramids where they would land at the bottom. If you ever want to see a movie that depicts this, uh, there's a movie called Apocalypto that you could watch uh, that, that talks about the Aztec culture. Uh, so the Aztecs, again, were probably the big powerhouse in Mesoamerica. They would have been the most powerful group you can see in this in this map that they were pretty extensive in their territorial holdings and again they were in what is now uh, modern day uh, Mexico and their capital is pretty much where Mexico City sits today. Now I'll talk about the Native American cultures that uh, were around north of Mesoamerica in what is now the United States which ultimately will be the groups that we talk about uh, the most, but it is worth contrasting how uh, Native Americans in some parts of the New World lived versus in present-day United States. So in present-day United States, the climate, it depended on where you lived. If you lived in the American Southeast, for example, North Carolina, you're going to have a pretty stable climate, but overall, throughout the majority of the United States, or what is now the United States, you do not have as dependable as a climate. Climate could be good for a few years or maybe even for a few decades, but it only took a couple of years of drought to wipe out a group or force them to move somewhere else. Uh, so aside from the American Southeast, uh, the climate was not nearly as dependable. And as a result, uh, you did see people continue to basically follow food sources around, animal herds around, uh, the bison a lot of people call them buffalo, but technically they're the bison. That would have been an animal herd that would have been followed a lot uh, across uh, present-day United States. You would see agriculture take place, but it would take place on a, a smaller scale, a less stable scale. And oftentimes, especially during drought years, uh, these uh, people would have to move in order to keep up with food sources because, again, agriculture was not as dependable. So their culture tended to be much more nomadic. So nomadic means when uh, it, it basically is a description of people that have to move. They can't stay in one place because their food source 
is not dependable. They're usually following animal herds. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see teepees. The reason that I'm showing you teepees is because teepees are basically tents. Tents are portable, and if you have tents or teepees, you're able to get up and move and follow your food sources whenever you need to. So why are you going to be following the animals? Again, because in most parts of the United States or present-day United States, keep in mind the United States isn't a country at this point, but why are you going to follow the animals? Because unless you have an extended period of stable weather, uh, the agricultural revolution isn't going to help you nearly as much. And so uh, there is going to be uh, a benefit to this, and that is that the Native Americans in present-day United States are going to basically be much more spread out and if they're spread out then they're going to be much more difficult to conquer in fact not until the very end of this course in the late 1800s will you see the United States government government actually be able to subdue Native American resistance one side note is that whenever you see something written in parentheses in my notes that is more of an option it's more of a nice to know, so you can write it if you want, but I won't count off if you don't write it. But the main thing that you need to note, again, is that because of the fact that people were chasing herds, you're going to see much smaller groups of Native Americans. Usually the, the, the bands of tribes would be no more than maybe a couple hundred people in size. And so whenever the United States wants to take out Native Americans and force them onto reservations, they're going to have a harder time because they're trying to basically round in a very spread out population and that's not easy to do. Basically every time they ran to a group of a couple hundred Native Americans they might have to fight a battle in order to put them on a reservation. So again in contrast with the Mesoamerican cultures that were in big centralized locations that were easy to kind of round up and, and take out when it comes to Native Americans in present-day United States, you will see them much more spread out and ultimately much more difficult for the United States to uh, round up and control. That being said, there were some exceptions. Oh, I got ahead of myself. Excuse me. Uh, first off, one of the problems, again, is that they cannot develop it as advanced civilizations. They are not going to be known for their technological innovations as much they spend much more time on the move. Uh, these uh, nomadic groups spend much more time basically chasing animal herds, and they don't have as much time to build cities. They don't have as much time to develop uh, complex mathematics or, or science or uh, astronomy or anything like that. Uh, you do have some exceptions, however, because there are going to be some times whenever some areas see extended periods of good climate, and you basically have kind of a mini agricultural revolution that is temporary in nature. So let's talk about a couple of these exceptions. The Anasazi are uh, their, the remains of their culture are seen in the top picture. The Cahokia mound builders, you see the remains of their culture at the, the bottom. So these two groups were able to build complex civilizations, uh, but they were not able to last very long. The, the civilization of the Anasazi. Uh, they are in a present-day desert, and as most of you know, desert is not a very good climate for growing crops. They were able to survive for a time, uh, but then eventually disappeared and, and ended up moving to more stable climate uh, areas. The same thing with the Cahokia Mound Builders in the, that's uh, depicted at the bottom. If you were looking at a map of the United States, the Anasazi were largely in the New Mexico area, and the mound builders that are depicted at the bottom picture, they were in southern Illinois, pretty much right across the Mississippi River from St. Louis. In fact, if you were to stand right here on top of this mound, uh, you would actually be able to see the St. Louis Arch from across the Mississippi River. I, I visited there once whenever I was younger. Uh, side note, these mounds that were built, they were built uh, kind of like the Egyptian pyramids, as places of burial for high-ranking members of their societies. Now earlier I told you that the most stable area in present-day uh, United States would have been, if you look at the mouse, in this area right here. This is the most stable climate. You, it's the, it has the best conditions for consistently growing crops. And one of the major groups that 
many of you are familiar with and have heard of would be the Cherokee. So the Cherokee are going to live in a very stable area. Uh, they are able to advance themselves. In fact, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Creek, the Choctaw, and the Seminole are sometimes referred to as the five civilized tribes in American history uh, because they were able to stay in one place for a longer period of time and do things like develop a little bit more complex culture. One thing that the Cherokee were known for doing was a, a method of farming known as three sister farming which you see right here on the right hand side where they would simultaneously grow squash and beans and corn all at the same time all in the same place and this was a very good system of planting because basically what one plant took out of the soil another plant might put into the soil and so it was a very sustainable method it was environmentally sound and that's going to contrast a lot with the American, the future American way of growing crops because in the future you're going to see people grow only corn or only squash or only beans or only tobacco or only one kind of, of labor source or not, excuse me, not labor source, food source. And one of the reasons for that is because we develop machines that uh, are built to harvest only one kind of crop at a time. Uh, in the end, in this area, in the American South, cotton will become, initially it's tobacco, but eventually cotton will become the major uh, crop in this area, and uh, people will be growing only one crop at a time, they're going to wear out the soil, uh, and, and that's going to cause environmental problems later on. The Cherokee, however, their methods, their three sister farming that you see here on the right, uh, was a much more environmentally friendly way to grow crops. Uh, one other noteworthy example of Native Americans in present-day United, United States is going to be what's known as the Iroquois Confederacy. What happens here is you have several different groups shown here in the map. This is in modern-day New York. They are going to, for mutual benefit, form a loose form of government. So they each had their separate identities. For example, you had the Seneca, you had the Oneida, you had the Mohawk. But they were loosely united under one central government. And whenever you have, and I want you to make sure that you take note of this, maybe highlight this or draw a star next to this. This is an example of a confederacy. You'll see in my notes I've put it in bold. A confederacy is whenever you take multiple small governments and you unite them under one weak central government. That's incredibly important to note because you should know that during the course of American History 1, you're going to talk about the American Civil War. And one of the reasons that the Confederate States of America fail to get independence from the United States is because they formed a confederacy. And their problem was, and you can see this in all caps, is that they had a weak government. Ultimately, what proves to be the strongest form of government is a form of government where the central government has some level of strength. If you have a central government that's too weak, you're not going to get certain things done that you need to get done, especially in time of war. So one way to think of a confederacy is to think of a basketball team where each player kind of does whatever they want on the court and they don't really listen to the coach all that much. They have a coach, but they aren't really that beholden to listen to what the coach says. A stronger central government, think of a coach that is strong and all the players play according to the game plan. Those teams tend to win. So confederacies tend to have weak governments. They tend to lose in wars. They tend to have unstable or instability within their governments. So keep that in mind, that idea of a confederacy that's going to come up multiple times throughout this course. In fact, before we had the Constitution, the United States created what was known as the Articles of Confederation, which was our first Constitution, and it fell flat on its face because it created too weak of a government. Okay, I'll now switch gears and talk about what's the, uh, known as the Old World, or basically the Eastern Hemisphere. Now, eventually, the Old World and the New World are going to come into contact. I'll get into why, basically starting now. So now we're talking about the Old World, which is basically the Eastern Hemisphere, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And what ends up happening is that you're going to see an age of exploration begin largely in Europe. So if you look at the map, basically this part of the map, 
And what ends up happening is that if you and you may remember this from world history is that there's going to be what's known as the Catholic Crusades. And during the Catholic Crusades, as the Catholic Church tries to expand itself, there is going to be a series of conflicts that happen in this area. And eventually, the Europeans become aware of lots of products in India, lots of products in China, which I'm pointing to in the map here, back and forth between here's India, here's about where China is, close to China. Uh, and basically, there's going to be certain products that are going to be found in this region that a lot of Europeans wanted. Silk was very popular. Spices was very popular. And so there was a lot of money to be made if you could take the products from this part of Asia, East Asia, and get it over here to Europe. Now, initially, this trade route was known as the Silk Road. So if you wanted to make money, you would basically travel on foot, maybe using animals and wagons, and you would travel all the way to India and to China, get these goods, and then bring them back over to Europe to make profit. The problem with this, though, is there's, it's multifaceted. One is that it's slow. It's on land. Two is that you can't carry very much in a wagon. And number three is that there is a sort of thing as pirates on land. And basically, anytime you went along this route, you might be subjected to pirates or bandits that are going to either attack you and steal your stuff, or they will charge you a hefty fee in order to pass without violence. So basically, long story short, the gra this route is going to be dangerous, it's going to be slow, it's going to be expensive, and a lot of Europeans are going to want to try to find a better uh, a more profitable uh, alternative to the Silk Road. And what that alternative will prove to be will be water routes using the ocean. Now that being said, using the ocean is not going to be as easy as it sounds. Uh, to go north uh, of Europe, you're going to run into frozen water. To go west from Europe, toward what is now the United States and the Americas. The problem there was that it was largely uh, unexplored and people didn't know what was over there. The, most people did not believe that the earth was flat. Most people did not believe that you would just go off the edge of the earth if you kept going west, but it was still uncharted territory. So the first option that people are going to take, again, they're not going to want to go up this way because the water freezes the further north you get. They're not going to want to go this way which again circles around eventually over to, to China and India because that's uncharted territory. So the first option is going to be to go around Africa and the first country that's really going to uh, pioneer this idea of going around Africa is going to be Portugal. So if you look at your notes at this point, You should see that we're at the top of the back, of the upper right-hand corner of the second page, just to make sure that we all are on the same page, literally speaking. Uh, so let's talk about Portugal. Portugal is going to decide to go, if you look at the mouse, Portugal's right here, and they're going to decide to go around Africa. Now this was very difficult to do because of certain currents and because of of uh, wind currents and of water currents. And again, remember going across the Silk Road this way was proving too slow, expensive, and dangerous. So they were willing to give this a try. In fact, the government is going to invest a lot of money and research into developing technologies to enable boats to safely navigate the coast of Africa and go around the Cape of Good Hope, as you see right here with the mouse. A leader arises in Portugal. He's referred to as Prince Henry the Navigator. He, again, is very interested in navigation technology, think GPS. He's very interested in, in, in travel technology, transportation technology, uh, developing uh, basically navigation technology and boats that can get the Portuguese around uh, the coast of Africa. So starting in Portugal here and going around here and then again, if you can get around Africa, things get much easier. Then you can go on to India, then you can go on to China, and then you can access all of these goods without having to worry about all the bandits and the, and the limitations of the Silk Road. So water travel, you can carry a heck of a lot more on a boat than you can in a wagon. 
So Portugal, for example, develops the Caravel. The Caravel is a, a uh, type of boat that is able to travel even if it's got if, it, if the winds aren't in favor of the sails. So the, the Caravel is going to be able to go around the coast. And one interesting thing to note about when they went around the coast is every once in a while they might have to stop on the coast for supplies, especially along the western coast of Africa. And at this point, Portugal becomes uh, introduced to a practice that was already in existence between different competing groups in Africa, and that is African slavery. And at this point, Europe is going to get its first taste of African slavery. They're going to start trading uh, some of their goods that they had that Africa didn't in exchange for slaves. And as you know, slaves are going to be free labor. Uh, one thing to note is that slavery was not attached necessarily to race at this point. Uh, slavery is much more attached to basically being a winner or a loser. In other words, if you were a conquered people that had been defeated in a war, then you would be enslaved. Uh, in the United States and in the New World, you're, that's where you're really going to see a racial component added to slavery beyond just being a loser in a war. So again, slavery up until this point, if you look in uh, past history, if you were a country that was conquered by another country, you may be enslaved. But eventually it will take racial overtones in the uh, New World once the Europeans are exposed to it in Africa. Moving forward. There's another country that decides it wants to be in on the exploration game, and if you look at the map, you can see where I'm pointing here, Spain. Here's Portugal right here, and then here's Spain. Now, Spain uh, and Portugal, they kind of wanted to get along. They are both Catholic nations uh, during the Protestant Reformation. They didn't exactly want to have a fight. The Pope wanted to keep the Catholic Church together. He couldn't afford to have the two Catholic countries competing. And basically, Portugal already had dibs going. If you look at the mouse, Portugal already had dibs going this way around Africa. So Spain is going to try a new route, and that's going to be a risky one because it's unexplored, and that would be to go west across the Atlantic Ocean. And again, the problem with this is that it was basically a largely unexplored area, and people did not know exactly what they were going to find. Again, most people did not believe that the Earth was flat, and most people did not believe you would just fall off the Earth. So what happens with Spain is they are going to commission an Italian named Christopher Columbus to basically look for this new western route. And you've learned about Christopher Columbus since your youth, probably since elementary school. Uh, it is There are competing theories as to whether or not he was the first. Most historians do not think he was the first person, uh, aside from Native Americans, to discover the New World. But the United States government still gives him credit for it with Columbus Day every October, even though uh, there is evidence that other groups, the Chinese or the Vikings, might have discovered the New World first. So uh, back uh, to Columbus. You'll notice that I put that it is disputed that he discovered the New World. But what he's going to do is he's going to take the route, I believe it's this one that I'm tracing right here, and October the 12th of 1492, despite the fact that he was running low on supplies and many of his own uh, crewmen were getting uh, tired of the voyage, he is going to land on an area of the New World known as the Caribbean Islands. Now, at the time, he thought he was in India. So far as I know, he died thinking that he was in India. So he's going to refer to this as the West Indies, and he's going to refer to the people in these lands as Indians. And so far as I know, he was never corrected on these notions. He is going to proceed to be very nasty to these Native Americans that he finds, and he is going to basically enslave a lot of them or have his crewmen enslave a lot of them and have them start looking for gold. Uh, so his treatment of the Native Americans is very nasty, but again, to keep this lecture from being too uh, long, I'll cut it short. Uh, but just note that Columbus was not very good to the Native Americans that he encountered. One of the first comments that he makes in his diary whenever he discovers them is that they would be easily enslaved. One other thing worth noting is that Christopher Columbus lands in this region. He never, in fact, saw what became the United States. So he is the European that gets the credit for discovering the New World, but he was not even the first European to see what ended up becoming the United States. One thing to note is that Spain is going to get the head start 
in the New World. Now, we know that the United States largely is going to be based off of English colonies later on, but Spain had basically first dibs in what became the United States. Finally, uh, and, and this is probably the most important part of this lecture, and this is the part that also is in your key terms list and is, is, is in your study guide, you need to know what the Columbian Exchange is. So you might as well go ahead and highlight and star or write in all caps or underline. Find some way to make yourself remember this definition, the Columbian Exchange. So uh, the Columbian Exchange, and you're right now in the middle part of the back of the notes, at the very top of the map, there's a, a box that says the Columbian Exchange, and that's where you'll put this definition. So a general definition of the Columbian Exchange is that it's basically everything that gets exchanged between the New World and the Old World when the two first meet. Again, at the beginning of this lecture, I told you that this was like having, almost like having aliens arrive in uh, on Earth. Uh, that's how contrasting these two worlds were in a lot of ways. And in fact, a lot of these Native Americans did not know how to react to the Europeans, and some of them saw them as not aliens, but as gods. More on that later when we get to Cortez in the next lecture. So if you look uh, at this chart here, you can see that the New World had plenty of things to offer the Old World. In other words, the Americas had plenty of things to offer uh, the Old World. So one thing that the New World had that the Old World wanted, one thing the Americas had that the Europeans especially wanted, was gold and silver those that were greedy were really looking forward to getting as much gold and as much silver out of uh, the New World as possible, even if it meant enslaving Native Americans, as I've already referred to. You will see new foods uh, that the New World has that the Old World doesn't, such as corn. But tobacco is very noteworthy. Let me go ahead and emphasize tobacco. You might want to circle tobacco because that'll be a big deal later on. Whenever... Europeans get their taste of tobacco, like many teenagers unfortunately, they become addicted to it and there is a lot of money to be made in tobacco. So what you're going to see over time, and we'll get more into this later, is you'll see eventually, especially in what is now Virginia and Maryland, and later on other parts of the American South, you're going to see the growth of tobacco. The more tobacco that is grown, the more that there are people that want this tobacco, and the more land that is needed to grow it on. When the Europeans want more land to grow it on, they're going to have to start taking it from Native Americans, which leads to fighting. Eventually, you're going to need a labor source big enough to harvest and plant and harvest this tobacco. The English initially are going to use indentured servants. When indentured servants rebel because of their mistreatment, you're going to see the Europeans turn to an easier to control labor source, and that is going to be slavery. The old world, the Europeans, also had several things to offer to the Americas and to the Native Americans. Sugar, rice, uh, horses. Horses will be a very big deal because some Native American tribes will have horses and some won't. The ones that do have horses will have the ability to move faster and chase herds better. They'll have power in war. Those that don't have horses will be weaker. Notice what I'm emphasizing here though. The major thing that comes out of the old world from Europe especially will be disease. Many diseases listed here, down here at the bottom if you follow the mouse, are going to be brought to the Native Americans and are going to kill off, some people estimate up to 90% of the Native Americans. And also, uh, uh, smallpox again will be the, the, the major one. But notice there's another, th uh, well, let me actually go back to the point on smallpox. So again, smallpox is going to wipe out up to 90% of the Native Americans. Uh, it's going to make them very easy to conquer, especially if they live in areas where diseases spread easily, like in the cities and civilizations of Mesoamerica. Let me go to the other theme. The other thing that comes from the old world is going to be slaves. Once the New World people start to grow things like tobacco in places like Virginia, they are eventually going to start using slaves to plant and harvest this tobacco. Later on in American history, you're going to see people uh, demanding cotton as well, and slaves will be used as the main labor source for this. So even at the very beginning of American history, before the United States is even formed, 
you already see the seeds planted for conflict with Native Americans over land and because they're dying off of diseases. And you're seeing the seeds of American slavery already being planted. So, sometimes I tend to repeat myself. Uh, you will see in the future disease wipe out many Native American populations, making them easier to conquer, especially in Mesoamerica. But you will also see the beginnings of African slavery which, as time goes on, will become much and much more vital to the economy of the United States. It'll become especially vital to the economy of the southern United States. And eventually there will be some movements within the United States, especially religious movements, that are going to make people, especially in northern states, see slavery as, as a sin, as a chief sin against God. And you'll see uh, the growth of what's known as the abolitionist movement. Of course, slavery is a central cause to the American Civil War, so here we are in the very first lecture already foreshadowing the coming of the Civil War because it does become a very divisive issue uh, in the end. More on that later. One quick other note is that right now you have two main countries that are uh, kind of vying for uh, rights to explore, and that's Portugal and Spain. And one issue was that they are both claiming new lands, but they were also both Catholic countries. The Protestant Reformation was underway. The Pope did not want these two countries to be fighting against each other. So what he's going to do is he's going to issue a claim. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so, again, both are Catholic nations. You don't want to have two Catholic nations uh, fighting against one another. Back then, uh, countries much more aligned themselves with certain religions. Uh, and again, the idea was that let's keep Spain and Portugal from fighting. Well, there is a pretty convenient solution to this for the Pope, and the, but the, what the Pope is going to do is he's going to look and he's going to say, well, Spain has already kind of gone and explored this area that I'm circling in the map. And uh, did I say Spain? Portugal. Portugal has already largely explored this area, so let's let them have dibs on that area, and maybe over here a little bit. And then everything over here is going to go to Spain and they can have the rights to explore all this area. Now, as we now know, uh, there was a lot more in terms of resources to be found in the land that Spain got, and the future United States was in the land that Spain got, but uh, no one could really tell that at the time. So the solution that the Pope offers will be the Treaty of Torresias, uh, and this is basically going to be creating, it's going to, there's going to be a line created, a line of demarcation, uh, and this is going to divide the land. The land basically to the east of it is going to be what, what Portugal can have. And the only part of the new world that Portugal has dibs on is this area right here. Many of you know that Brazil is here today. And many of you know that the main language of Brazil is Portuguese. And that's why. On the western side of this line, that's what Spain has dibs on. So they are going to have dibs on what becomes eventually Mexico. That's why people in Mexico and, Sp and, and Latin America largely speak Spanish outside of Brazil. And also, of course, you know that Spain eventually is going to be in parts of what is now the United States. They're going to settle what is today Florida right here in the map. They're also going to settle up in here where it is now uh, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas. Uh, more on that later on. But what this treaty does is it prevents there from being tension between two Catholic nations in the midst of a crisis of the Catholic Church known as the Protestant Reformation. So as a consequence, again, Spain is the country that's the first to explore what eventually becomes the United States. And as you know, eventually we will be talking about the United States. I'm in background information in this first unit. Uh, but again, as you see, Spain is going to be the first to settle in the new uh, new world that becomes, or the part of the new world that becomes the United States. Uh, and you can even see Spanish influence today. So if, for example, you go to, uh, to this area of the country, to California, you'll see a lot of the names of cities are Spanish in origin. Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego. So you see a lot of Spanish influence in the American Southwest. Uh, and that dates back all the way to this treaty that was signed back uh, in the 1400s, shortly after Columbus had his voyage. 
And that concludes the first lecture. I look forward to teaching you again in lesson number two.